get that started, we're good to go. Oh, it's a beautiful
We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I have some joys and concerns this morning to share. Uh, we have three birthdays this week. Cool. Pat Cleveland, Sandy Cook, and uh, Madeline Wall. Chris is uh, one of his daughters. So if you know those people, <laughs> I think you know at least two of them. Uh, please uh, make sure that you should have birthday this week. Uh, we have a concern. Dan and Betts asked for prayers for Linda. She is the mother-in-law of their son, Scott, she's having some serious health issues. So we want to lift up Linda and her family. Mm -hmm. And have a, a card that was in our basket in the back there. Uh, joy, Thanksgiving for church family members who shared their gift of music with us. Hmm. Indeed, indeed. Okay. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, we have a concern uh, for the people of Ukraine, Russia, and all those in the world who this day are fighting mm. or living in the midst of war. Mm. We have one concern that I was, became aware of last night. Uh, you may have heard there was a shooting yesterday in Buffalo, New York, at a grocery store. And it's been just over a year now since the events just down the street. So if today you would be intentional about lifting up the people of Buffalo <clears throat> and all those who are dealing now with the aftermath of yet another shooting. Are there other joys or concerns that we could lift up before the community and God this morning? We have one in the back there. I want to give a big thank you to Belinda and Marcia for helping with the refreshments today. I couldn't do it without them. And also pray that this last injection I had in my back works. Yes. Amen. For those of you who uh, were not here last week, Pastor Charles hand painted these wonderful little uh, flower pots. And there's a table at the back wall of the fellowship hall next to us um, that has about um, maybe 40 or 50 left of them. So um, feel free to take one for yourself or, or several or some for your neighbors and friends. But you're welcome to have this little memento of um, Mother and Nurturing Sunday. Probably spring, everybody. Take as many as you can carry. <laughs> I just wanted to update you guys on my little sister Lydia who has just had a complete hip replacement um, while being autistic and almost totally nonverbal. She has done so well from the very start, from the time she came out of anesthesia. I asked her, did Lydia, did your hip hurt? She said, she doesn't say no or yes, she just says, my hip doesn't hurt. And now she's walking with a walker, which she's about done with, but her house mom kind of wants her to use it because she's a little paranoid, I think. So Lydia, who is totally nonverbal, her joke is she carries the walker. <laughs> she <laughs> Good exercise. So we want to lift up Lydia and her house mother. Yes, yes. Though we've promised not to make a fuss and there's not going to be any official celebration here as there sometimes is among the church family, we do want to honor Ben who graduates from Mulder High on Saturday. Okay, um, I just want to have some prayers for my nephew's wife and um, her family who have just escaped from the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. They've now gone, they were living in a state in the house and it was the mother, daughter-in-law, and two, two children, plus two sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, the father was there too. And then they decided to drive over to Georgia. I guess they could get into Georgia. That was quite a hefty, hefty move for them. And so they went to Georgia, but the dad decided to stay behind and take care of the house and not just leave it to rot, you know, and all the stuff there. 
And um, so they got to Georgia and found out that the, the dad had died of a heart attack. It was just too much stress and too much going on that, that he, he just couldn't handle it. And so now my nephew's wife is, is flying over on Tuesday to Georgia to see the family and, and console with them. So if we could have some prayers, I'd appreciate it. What, what, what was his name on What was his name? I don't know. And your Oksana is the gal. Oksana. The family, um, I am grateful for the prayers for my little sister Carrie, who had extensive back surgery on Monday. They released her on Thursday, which I thought was ridiculous, um, but she wanted to go home. She went home. She fell twice that night, so she went back in the hospital the next day. And now she's fighting going to rehab because of her dog. She doesn't want to leave her dog. So prayers that we can work this out. I know that her healing will be much better if she goes to rehab. And um, just prayers for that because her husband doesn't like the dog. And she's very concerned about the dog. So anyway, she's, they, they have a lot of inter-family issues going on right now in addition to the, the, the recovery. So prayers for Carrie. Smith. Thank you. Are there others? Was God doing anything in your life this week that you could lift up or celebrate? <laughs> Dave, in the back. And then also, uh, right here, Ben. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have one. Uh, the second time I went to the men's breakfast uh, yesterday morning, I uh, had a very good time, great information, great gossip, although I'm sure it's all true. <laughs> um, and what I commented to Sandy, she went to the women's breakfast too, and I commented that, uh, I said, you know, uh, this was a group of, what do we have there, 10 guys? 10 guys. Six women. And uh, I said they all gave us a chance to talk and they listened. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Dave. So if we're going to give thanks, I would say give thanks to my partner, Jackie. Um, she has been a big help this week. And thanks for the, uh, the team that worked on my hip. Um, they were amazing. Um, I was done in about an hour and a half. And they were ready to let me go the next day. And the recovery has been pretty quick. So God has been watching over me. I invite you to center yourself and bring all of this before our God. Gracious God, in the stillness of our hearts, there is a, a sound bursting forth. A sound that tells us that your love is stronger than anything that we can imagine or have experienced. Mm -hmm. And yet, while we know this to be true, that we have the faith that says you are there with us, we still go through hard times. We still hear about war. We still hear about people harming other people. We still know of death and disease and hate and famine and all the rest. But in the stillness of our heart, there is also that whisper that speaks of your name that speaks deep within us of that healing that comes from the great physician that comes from experiencing love in community that's why we can lift up and pray for people in lands far away that most of us will never visit that's why we can show compassion and sympathy and empathy for those who have experienced life as we have. 
Oh God, this is the day that you have given us. And so we bring before you our joys and our sorrows. Those who are in recovery and those who are facing health issues of their own. We bring before you the celebrations of birthdays and graduations, of homecomings, and, and of music. Which is God, we hold nothing back from you. For who we are is who you made us. We hold nothing back from you because you hold nothing back from us. Mm -hmm. Loving and merciful and gracious God, by whatever descriptor we offer, we know that there is so much more. And so because there is the reality of you in our midst, we are bold to gather each week offering that prayer that your son, the one we call Lord and Master, as he taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Thank God. <laughs> So that we didn't have to make Lori play piano with one. 
one end and flute with the other. We are thrilled to have Penny Park sitting in this morning on the piano. So we hear this wonderful duet. Some of the time we can't help but burst into applause at the final note, 
At other times, the most fitting response is a soft, heartfelt sigh. The Christmas cantata is for many of us the glittering star atop the season's Christmas tree. Lori, there is magic in your fingers on the keyboard. You work tirelessly perfect for perfection in each exquisitely curated piece. It is because of you that we decided to rearrange the order of worship because we couldn't bear to be chatting away heedlessly during prelude and postlude, but wanted to sit still in appreciative silence, savoring every measure presented to us not only with dazzling musicianship, but with visible love. You have enriched worship more than we can say. Suzanne. No one knows better than I do the challenge of bell ringing <laughs> and the challenge of turning, well, people like me into bell ringers. Your unfailing patience and kindness and encouragement have led us to dazzle ourselves with the music we are able to make together. You have made us be more than we ever could have believed possible. Nor can we neglect to thank you for your offerings at the keyboard and for your leadership in figuring out how to keep music as a cherished aspect of worship during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Dearest Louise and Christopher and Hedgy, we thank you too for your faithful sharing of your musical gifts on so many Sundays, and Charles and Melinda for having the foresight to have recorded so much music that we can enjoy during those dozens of weeks of Zoom worship, and to share now with the wider world via YouTube and social media. If ever there was a congregation blessed with music, it is ours. Please join me in thanking our beloved musicians now. And God will be fully present among them. 
The Most High will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death and mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the old order has fallen. The one who sat on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. And he added, Write this, for what I am saying is trustworthy and true. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Over the previous 20 chapters of the revelation of Jesus Christ to John, there are, or were rather, a lot of heavy stuff. I mean, you get to the seven seals and you know, death on riding on a horse and all the, you know, the trials and tribulations and you know, generations of preachers have tried to tell you this or this is going to happen and you need to be afraid. Or as a gunnery sergeant at chaplain school told a group of us when we said, you know, Gunny, you ought to be a chaplain. And he said, no, nope, I'd have one sermon. Y'all are going to hell, let's turn to First Thessalonians and find out why. <laughs> <laughs> so for generations, 1900 years, Christians have read this or other um, apocryphal books, books talking about the end of time, and has said, this is why we should be afraid of God. Because God is going to punish you. God hates what you're doing. God may even hate you, because I do. We have looked at this book, particularly the book of Revelation, and said, you know, if there's something better coming, I'm not going to be good enough to be there. Because my sin is too great for God to forgive. My enemies are too evil for God to welcome. This world is too broken for God to redeem. But I would put it to you this morning that what the book of Revelation teaches us and offers to us is not a word of fear, but a word of promise. Not a promise of, you know, you better get your life in order because you're going to get smitten as soon as you walk through the pearly gates, if you're lucky enough to get there. What this passage teaches us is that God's redemption will be like nothing we can imagine. Because for 20 chapters, John spoke about what he thought and what he experienced in his vision. But he was using words, uh, as I said last week, using words to describe something that none of his listeners or readers had ever experienced. No, sure, they had experienced death. They had watched loved ones die or get sick. They had watched empire after empire sweep through the region, bringing death and destruction with them. So they understood the language of judgment. They understood, understood the language of death. That's not what Revelation is about. Revelation is about God having the last word. And that's a beautiful thing. So I want you to imagine yourself. You're having this vision. And remember that John is not predicting the future. He is you know, revealing what he himself 
has experienced. And so he offers this vision that says, Folks, you're not going to believe what I saw. It, it's, it's so incredible. I've got to tell you about it. <laughs> this was my vision. That I saw a city descending from the clouds. I mean, come on. <laughs> a city descending from the clouds. Yeah, that's what I saw. And it wasn't just any city. It was the city of David, the city of God, the new Jerusalem. That city that in his lifetime, in John's lifetime, had been reduced to rubble by the Roman legions under Vespasian. And John's saying, God isn't going to replace what you've already known, what you've always seen. God is going to usher into a new Jerusalem. So the one thing I want you to know above everything else from Revelation is that what God is doing is going to be different than anything you can imagine. Here it is. And, I mean, if you can't get a little goosebump when you're reading Revelation, and not, not because you're afraid of being smitten, although some of us probably deserve it, <laughs> some more than others, I'm, I'm not looking at anyone in particular. In this Revelation, or in this vision of John, he says, the former heavens and the former earth had passed away, and the sea existed no longer. In Jewish writing, in early Christian writing, the sea represented chaos. So I want you to hear what John's readers might have heard. The chaos brought by the empire will be no more. If you're in the first century imagining a world without the Roman Empire, the might of Caesar, the destroyer of worlds, that that will be no more. Well, the problem with that is that and this is one of the few things I remember from my biology classes, or the two times I took it, <laughs> was that nature abhors a vacuum. That in the absence of something, something else will replace it. So if you're in the first century and you're hearing that the empire will be no more, the first thought is, well, what replaces it? Will the next empire be worse? Will the next version of Caesar, whatever they call it, what will that person do to me and mine? And so it, it comes into this, this experience that God is saying, or John is recording rather, I saw a new Jerusalem a city coming down out of heaven from God. A new Jerusalem not made with human hands. Not given to greed or envy or whatever ism of the day. This is something new and something amazing. And remember last week I said something about, you know, this is a new language. That any word we have in the modern English language is incapable of describing this. Even 
the, the Greek that John wrote in doesn't exist anymore. Even modern Greek, which has about as much to, as relationship to New Testament Greek as modern English does with Beowulf, or Chaucer, or anybody else like that, is that humans have spent millennia trying to describe what is around them, trying to describe what they can see and taste and touch. John is trying to describe something new. Now, I don't, it's, it's one of those philosophical arguments about if I go to the market and buy a dozen eggs and I crack an egg, what will I find? An egg. The yolk. <laughs> egg white. Okay. What if I crack two eggs? What will, what will be in the second egg? How do you know? Might be uh, two yolks. Experience. Okay. What if you're wrong? What if the 101st egg is different than the first egg? John is saying to us, Break all the eggs you want. Because in the new city, in the new Jerusalem, in the new life, everything that you think you know will be gone. Everything that you have based your life experience upon will be irrelevant. And you think, well, wait a second. What about my children? What about my dog? What about my country? What about, what about me? John says in his vision, oh, my friends, all of that will have a new meaning. All of that will speak to you in ways that are beyond your comprehension. Well, you say, well, why should I, why should I sign up for that? I mean, you know, we live in a culture where you, you buy something at the store and the fine print of all the stuff that's contained in that package, or all the, you know, you get a pill bottle and you know, the instructions are, you know, the warning. And we think that's life because we want guarantees. We want to know that what we believe is somehow going to benefit us. What we know is to be true. Because if it's not true, then why support it? Why give your life in service or in and worship to that which is unknown. John says to us, I heard a loud voice calling from the throne. Look, God's tabernacle is among humankind. God will live with them. They will be God's people. And God will be fully present among them. What John is saying is that heaven, the next life, is not a repetition of this life. To hear that, this heaven or this new reality is not a return to what has been known before. Because if it's just going to be more of this, then what do we need God for? John is saying, and I believe that 
if you if you go back and read the the in, well read the entire book of Revelation, but not with a, uh, an eye for what's going to go wrong or how you personally will benefit. But look at what God is doing. The entirety of the scriptures, all 66 books, all the books that got taken out of the canon or weren't included in the canon to begin with, <laughs> they all address one topic, and that is the redemption of God of creation. The idea of a new Jerusalem or a new world is not a return to Eden. This is something new. Because even in Eden, God's home was not there. Creation was there. But that's not where God dwelt. Here it's saying, God will be present. And I want you to think about what that means for us. I want you to think about what it means to be in the presence of God. What would be different for you? What in your life would suddenly change? What in your life would suddenly be irrelevant? What would God's redemption be for you? Because in this book, in this chapter, we hear what God is saying to creation. Now, what limited knowledge I have about the cosmos could fit on the dot of the period. Now, I think that the universe is expanding. Larry, is that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we have it with authority. We said it. But what is the universe expanding into? What is beyond the limits of the stars? That occupies our thoughts and our thinking. Whether you're intentionally saying, I wonder what's beyond the last star. This is saying, go as far as you can go in this life. Be the most amazing mother, father, sister, brother, friend. Be all you can be. To use the old commercial for, I think it was the army. <laughs> Go ahead. Savor this life. Live it to the full. And when you're done, set it aside. Everything you see at a garage sale or at a thrift store was new ones. Somebody paid top dollar for them. And when that person was dead and gone, somebody else came into their house, said, huh. Gave it away or threw it away. Everything you treasure in your home somebody else will come and make a judgment on. It may not be what you want, but there it is. John's saying to the church, go ahead. Make all the, the basilicas, make all the house churches, praise God in every way you can imagine. And when you're done, Set it aside. Because when you are in the presence of God, all of that, all of it will pale in comparison. Because we are invited. No, 
That might be the wrong word. God will dwell with us. And that will be enough. Mm -hmm. It will be enough because whatever you, whatever else you can imagine about God, we hear John say, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Most High will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death, mourning, crying, and pain will be no more, for the old order has fallen. Imagine. Go as far, as far as your imagination can take you. And when you get to the end, when you've gone as far as you can go, look around you and imagine how much more there is. This idea of a new world, a new heaven, a new reality, it's not a reality that we can comprehend. Because there are worlds out there in the universe that are beyond anything we can comprehend. We're still learning things about this planet. Imagine 100 million light years away. Imagine what kind of worlds are there can't. Because none of us have been there. It's like nothing that's here. And that, that's the beauty of faith. That's the beauty of our faith. That's what you're a part of. Not an institution, but a journey that will draw you ever closer to an awareness of what God is doing what God is. And once, once you enter into that journey, imagine what you personally will be like when you feel the redemption offered through God. The future is not going to be the past. The present is not what we will have, have in the future. The past, the past is gone. What we have to come, what we have, what we will know to be true, is the last word offered by God. What I have said is trustworthy and true. Each of us has told a lie at some point in our life. Each of us has depended upon a system that is incapable of caring about you personally. Systems do not care. But John says, I heard with my own ears the voice of God saying this is true. Not open to interpretation, not open for debate. What I have said is true. I will redeem creation on my terms, in my time, in my way. But I invite you to be there and experience it with me. It 
is done. Amen. This last hymn, this is one of those hymns that is either sung well or not. But I believe that it is sung with enthusiasm. If you look at the uh, instructions, Wesley's instructions for singing in the front of the hymnal, it says, sing with all the enthusiasm you can muster. So I invite you to stand if you are able and sing with enthusiasm, crowning with many crowds. <laughs>